All right, is that any better? You hear me loud and clear better? Give me a thumbs up, somebody. Great, thank you very much. All right, God bless everyone. Let me honor the presence of the Lord in this place this afternoon, this evening. Certainly God is with us and we're grateful for his mercies and his love. My good friend and brother, Brother Raymond too. I see Brother James online likewise. Others, um, brothers and sisters in Christ, please accept greetings. And if there are any visitors, certainly it's good to have you joining with us tonight in the name of the Lord. All right, so I'm tasked with the responsibility to share with you from a thought. Love for God drives soul winning. Love for God drives soul winning. And I want to use for a text tonight, Luke chapter 10, 25 through 29. What I'm going to do is ensure that we have other participants participating with me. So I see Sister Faith Mighty. I'm going to ask you to just open your word, open up the word, and find for me Luke chapter 10, 25 through 29. That's Luke chapter 10, 25 through 29. Right? We're looking at love for God. It does something to us. It drives us to soul winning. We're going to see that in this lesson. And as we take this time out to just share for a few moments from the word of the Lord. Come on in, Sister Mighty, and share with us. Um, read for us, please. And that's Luke chapter 10, verses. I didn't get the verse. Sorry about that. 25 to 29. Oh, it's 25. And it reads, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willingly do justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Verse 30 and last. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Should I continue? Should I continue? Oh, it, Pastor, it seems like you're muted. Oh. oh. Are you hearing me now? Am I being heard now? Yes, we're here. Yes, now. sir. All right, great. I'm not sure when I am, and you're hearing me. I am not hearing you. Hold on. Check one, check one, two, one, two. Microphone check, one, two, one, two. Microphone check. All right. You're hearing me now again, Brother Matthew? Yes, we're hearing you. All right. Great, great. All right, so love for God. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mighty. Appreciate it very much. Love for God drives soul winning. Notice in this particular text, um, the question was asked concerning the commandment that the Lord outlined for us, that we must love the Lord thy God with all of our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind and our neighbor as ourselves. Very, very crucial. And he dives into the story of the Good Samaritan that we're quite familiar with to illustrate love for God and love for my neighbor as myself. What I want to bring to our attention for a few moments is the fact that if God was motivated by love to come to this earth, made himself of no reputation, put on flesh, went through hell, the agony, the shame, the pain, was crucified and, and loved him to the cross. Weeks. 
the competitors must fight to the death. To the point where he suffered, bled, died, and was buried. That same love now dwelleth in us through the power of the Holy Ghost. Talk to me, somebody. If that same love is inside of me that moved God from heaven to earth, and why did it bring, to, bring him to earth? To seek and to save that which was him to reach lost humanity. And if that same love is inside of me, talk to me, brothers and sisters. I've got to go. I've got to reach. I've got to demonstrate. I've got to manifest that love that I have with, for God, that the love that I have for, for, with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul. Otherwise, how dwelleth? First John asked the question, the love of God in us. And he says, if we have this world's goods and we lock it up and we see our brother in need and don't supply that need, how dwell the love of God in us? So if we have that love, my brothers and sisters, I'm saying that we have the motivation to do the will and the agenda and the purpose of the, the mandate of the church, which is to go and to make disciples of all men. And that's all we need to reach the lost and dying. And so when we talk about this love that we have for God, we're talking about a desire for others now to experience the love that we have experienced. If I experience the love of God, and I'm, ex and I, and I'm experiencing the joy that came in that love, and the grace and the mercies that comes with that love, I cannot sit down with that. And don't give it to somebody else. My God and Savior Jesus. I want us to think about this thing clearly. So naturally, if I, we, we do this on a natural, from the natural side, where we discover this sales, this, 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 this new adventure or opportunity to make money. And lo and behold, we tell everybody, I will reach out to others. To let them know that, guess what? There's a way to make money. But guess what? We now have the greatest of all. Something that is greater than money. Love of God. David says the loving kindness of God is better than life. We have something that is worth more than my life. And I have that within me. It's going to motivate me to go and reach somebody and bring them to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, how dwelleth the love of God in us? We want them to have the same joy, the same peace, the same protection that our Heavenly Father provides. So that is, that is one of the ways the love is demonstrated, by having that desire. Number two, obedience. 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 So it, the Bible says if we love God, we will actually keep his commandments. So if I don't love him, I will not keep his commandments. Right? So if I obey the commandments of the Lord, what is the commandments of the Lord? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Make disciples of all men. Lord of mercy, Jesus. So if I love him, I will be obedient to him. And brothers and sisters, I can't, I can't go halfway in obedience. No. It was Abraham who was commanded by God to leave his hometown, leave his family and go. And as long as he had his father with him, God would not bless him. He traveled and carried daddy with him, and God would not bless him until, because guess what? Partial obedience is called disobedience. And so if I love him, not only am I motivated by this desire that is naturally within through the power of the Holy Ghost, but I am also obedient to the word of God. That's number two. Number three. I have the same compassion. We're talking about loving manifestation now. I have the same compassion that Jesus. Oh, God of mercy, Jesus. My God. <laughs> oh, God of mercy. Jesus saw persons on many occasions and was moved with compassion. Let, 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 let me bring us a place of understanding. The man at the gate, beautiful, was there for how many years? 38 years. Jesus died at what age? 33 and a half years. You know what that means? 
That man was at that school before Jesus was born. Guess what? He was waiting on the love of God to reach him, my God and Savior. And so you are born, good God from heaven, and you have the love of God invested in you. And somebody probably was born before you is waiting on you to bring deliverance to their to their soul. Next, next, oh Jesus, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. The compassion, the love for God caused me to emphasize, caused me to be moved with compassion towards somebody, to identify with somebody in their plight, in their situation, in their crisis, and lift them out of it and bring them to the place. Because guess what? Such were some of us. And there goes I if it had not been for Jesus Christ. My God and Savior, Jesus, have mercy upon us, God. And so we are moved. If I have the love of God, I cannot have it and not be moved with compassion. It's impossible. I've got to be moved. I will, brothers and sisters, the, the Bible says, if I see a blind man heading to a ditch and don't stop him enough and he falls into it enough, I have sinned. If I watch a blind man walk into a ditch and fall into the ditch, and I didn't stop him. I have sinned against God. <laughs> oh, God of mercy, Jesus. But when the love of God is within, I am motivated. I will not watch that man walk into that ditch. I'll block him. I'll stop him. I'll do everything to ensure that he doesn't fall into that ditch. We're talking about compassion. We're talking about having the desire that comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. Being obedient. Being compassionate. Number four, being grateful. Being thankful that God has given us his grace. Because had it not been for the grace of God, none of us would be saved. And let me tell you something. None of us can do nothing, absolutely nothing to earn our salvation. It takes God Almighty in his love, his mercy, and his grace to provide that which is needed for us to be saved. Let me paint the picture for you. Those who are online in the background, I'm going to ask you to give me your attention. Please, don't be distracted. Pay keen attention to what I'm saying. I'm going to say some very important things, and I want you to get these things in your spirit. It's very, very crucial that you do. You're driving your car. I'm explaining grace. So we, for, so we can see what grace looks like. Because we have, oftentimes in Christendom, how we define grace, we call it the unmerited favor. But that's kind of too technical and too big for me. I have to cut the bricks into smaller portion. I can see it and handle it and touch it and experience it. So you're driving your car and you run the red light. The policeman stops you on the other side. Says, ma'am, sir, you have broken the light. And you say to the officer, officer, give me a chance. That's called mercy. The officer says to you, ma'am, sir, may I have your document? The driver's license up when you give it to him. When you give it everything, guess what? Your driver's license up, your fitness up, your registration up, your insurance up. What do we do with you? We seize you and the car. We seize you and the car. <laughs> but then the officer turned to you and said, Ma'am, sir, how much does it cost to put your car back on the road and get it legal and all your documents? And you said to him, Sir, you in your wildest imagination go answer the question. I said, um, $300,000. And the officer goes into his pocket and take out $300,000 and give it to you. That's called grace. Unmerited favor always comes after mercy. I did nothing to deserve that. Now watch this now. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Hear me well. We get the children told, you know what we do? We stop at the supermarket. And stop at KFC. You're a wicked person. Wicked. You have a debt. And it, you, it was provided for you to put back everything in divine order. The grace. The grace. The grace. The grace came to you. The grace was given to you. Unmerited. You didn't do anything. He gave it to you. And you take it and go to the supermarket. You take it and stop a burger king. You're an abuser of grace. You don't understand grace. I have been saved by grace. And I know somebody else who is in that condition. I need grace. And I don't give it to him. 
If I am grateful in it at all, if I am thankful for the grace that God has given to me, part of my expression of that thanksgiving is to share it with somebody else, is to give it to somebody else. The Bible puts it this way in Matthew 25, I think it is. Peter says, how many times should I forgive? 70 times 7, the Lord says. And he reads a story to illustrate the point of forgiveness. Because that's grace. Grace is forgiveness. That's what we all need, forgiveness. Because we can't go through life without it. And he gave the talent, he gave the story of a man who had 10,000 talents. And the king right off the dead. The man walked out and bought a friend of 100 pence. And couldn't write and put him in prison. He got grace and couldn't communicate the grace. He got a debt written off and could not communicate it. Hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. The debt that we hold God in is that 10,000 talents, and God forgave us. And when one of our brothers or sisters offend us, tell lie on us, cheat on us, all manner of evil against us, that's only 100 pence. Dear me, not forgive my brother for 100 pence when God writes off $10 million off my record and, and say, go free. And I got it. Prison, the man was thrown in afterwards. Left to the tormentors, unforgiveness torment him night and day because he could not communicate the grace of God. And guess what? If we have God's grace that he has given to us and save our souls, dare we not communicate that grace and bring salvation to somebody else. So that's number four, grace. Let me go again. Number one, desire is that it's sprung from the Holy Ghost. Number two, obedience. Number three, compassion. Number four, gratitude for the grace of God. And number five, partnership with Almighty God. Oh, God of mercy, we have an opportunity to partner with God. Because guess what? Only Jesus alone can, can win souls in the Can I tell you? But he's now tabernacle inside of us, and he's going to use us as vessels to reach the souls. Because guess what? Mankind is dead, dead, dead in trespasses and sin. There's only one man I can, know raise, that can raise the dead in the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he dwells in me. So guess what? Through the power of the Holy Ghost, I can raise the dead. But guess what? I have been given the opportunity to partner with him to see the miraculous. Partner with him to do his will. Partner with him to accomplish the purpose for which he came. His life is shortened. And he says, you're going to do what I have done since you're my disciple. But because I've got to go, you're going to do greater than me. John 14, 12 tells us that. And so I, I have this awesome opportunity to partner with Almighty God to rescue the lost and dying because that's why he came in the first place. Because it is not his will for any to perish, but for all to have eternal life. And we get to partner with God. Oh, my God. The creator of heaven and earth. I get the awesome opportunity to be in partnership with God. Whoa. To fulfill the will of God. To live a fulfilling life. And live life more abundantly. And have the assurance of home with Jesus. Of being at home with Jesus afterwards. Being, being, being with him for all of eternity. I get that opportunity to partner with the greatest partner ever. But then there are consequences if we don't go. So, so wrapping up that session, we need to have the desire inspired by the Holy Ghost. Number two, we've got to be obedient to, God, obedient to God's word. Number three, we must have compassion. Number four, we must be grateful. And number five, we have the opportunity to now partner with God. We're talking about the love, what it has done to us, enabled us to submit so we can partner, show gratitude, be compassionate, be obedient, and motivated by that desire called love. But there are consequences. And Matthew 5, 14 to 30 tells us about the consequences. So we are told of a story of a man who got some talent, five, two, and one. And the man with the five went out and traded it. The one with the two traded it. The one with the one, he buried it. Follow me closely. He traded the five and got five more. One and two traded to two and got two more. One and two one buried it. Now the day of reckoning comes. You have to give an account for that which God has given us. All of us have the Lord's goods. We have Holy Ghost. We have life. We have time. Let me say it again. We have time. We have time. <laughs> 
We just use it otherwise than to do the thing that matters most because only what's done for Christ we love. We have time. We have talent. We have treasure. We have everything we need to get the job done. There's nothing lacking. Everything we need is available to be successful in this endeavor. And so there are consequences. And the consequences we saw in that text in Matthew chapter 25, where 14 to 30, where the man with the one that buried it, when it was time for his him to get caught, the Bible says, the wicked and slothful, lazy servant. It didn't say wicked and lazy spinner. It's a wicked and lazy servant. That means wicked and lazy pastor, wicked and lazy chorister, wicked and lazy musician, wicked and lazy usher, wicked and lazy same. If we have the Lord's goods and bury it and don't do anything with it, who be unto us? That man was what we had was taken from him and he was thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping and national peace. And so there are consequences. But I don't want to be motivated by consequences to get the job done. We need to be motivated by the love of God. And though I am here sharing with you concerning evangelism and reaching the lost and dying, it must be done from a place of relationship. That is my last point. It must be done from a place of relationship. So I look at first, number one, love being manifested. I look at the consequences, number two. And number three, I'm saying it needs to be done from a place of relationship. For example, give the example and it tells us clearly Peter is in prayer as he normally is and while he's in prayer because he has developed these habits these customs that are crucial for growth and maturity in Christ the Lord interrupted his prayer and said listen to me I have some men downstairs I can show you a vision with some animals in a sheet right kill it eat and Peter responded, I don't eat anything common or unclean. And then the Lord pulled him out of that and instructed him to go with the men that are downstairs. So you got to understand, Peter was not praying to find out where to go. Lord, I want something to do for you, Lord. I want something to do for you, Lord, today. Show me what you want. No, he was praying and fostering and developing his relationship with God so he can be at that place or should God say, hey, I'm ready for you. He's ready. So he has a devotional lifestyle. As you know, and I know, that Peter would not go into a Gentile house under normal condition. It had to take God Almighty to pull him out. And even when God pulled him out, he was still struggling. But guess what? He got his assignment out of his relationship. That's the point I'm trying to make. He got his assignment. He got his duty out of the relationship that he has. And then he goes. And then I ask the same thing. And then I ask the spring. And the Lord said, hey. I wanted to go down to the street called Straight by Jason Holt. There's a man down there called Saul. You see, you're coming in there. I tell you, Ananias don't want to go there. Ananias is doing what he normally does, fosters his relationship, praying, seeking the face of God. And I want you to notice something. These men are praying. And these men are getting response. We're not talking about saying a prayer. Because too many of us say prayers and we don't hear nothing. Prayer is two-way flow of information. This man heard, go down to the street called Straight. Go to Jason's house. Somebody's down there by the name of Saul, waiting on him. You're coming in, laying hands on him. Your case of blindness is going to go. And, 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 and Ananias is saying, Lord, but that's the man who wants to, who going around killing Christians. And say, yes, man, that's the same one I'm talking about. He's a chosen vessel to me. That means Ananias is saying, well, Lord, if you say so, no, I'm willing to lose my life for you because I love you more than anything else. That comes with a relationship. And out of that relationship, he is tasked with our duty to go. If we love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, we will go. Guaranteed. If we don't love him, that's another. Over to you. Over to you, brother. If you... Amen. You have time, sir. Go ahead. You have time. Do you, you want to give me more time? I think you should use it. Uh, you could use the time for the question, you know. Because I think a couple of questions are in the in the room. <laughs> yes, I am sure. Amen. Um, that there are some questions. So 
were you finished or you want to bring in the questions and then go with the questions? Yes, I'm through. I'm through. I, I kind of summarized what I wanted to say in 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 in, in half an hour. I could have straight straight go more, but I want to I want to give some persons an opportunity to, to ask because sometimes usually the question and answer session take a little time, especially in yes. helping persons to appreciate. All right, so I, I'll throw the question, the first question out there. You just spoke about um, um, the slothful servant, right? Um, lazy. Is it is it an okay thing to call the people of God lazy? Um, if not, how do we navigate in? bringing across the message in comparison to one being lazy? How do we navigate that? That's a word that the Bible uses on more than one occasion. In fact, the, the wise man Solomon has a couple of verses well that he deals with the slothful, the lazy. Um, I just use the words that the Bible uses because I think they are impactful and meaningful and I, I don't think it's enough sense. And if 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 you there's a course I do at Bible school, and if you look at the description as to how God describes his people in the Old Testament, it would make your mouth drop down. And call them <laughs> he, he, he style them as prostitutes. I'm gonna lift your skirt off your head, a basket of red fruit ready for judgment, and all manner of names he described them. In describing the situation for them to see their condition. So um, the Bible uses the word, so I believe I'm at liberty to do the same. Amen. Thank you. Amen. If there are any questions at this, further questions at this time, please feel free to raise your hands and um, we will acknowledge you. Amen. I know Minister uh, James had a question, so I'll also let him go ahead uh, with his question. Go ahead, Minister Barrington James. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Um, uh, Pastor Brother Willis, bless you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think sometimes, you know, bid to be so political, politically correct and inoffensive? We lose the essence of what is it that the Lord commands us to, 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 to speak. You know, um, the, and and this is a really a follow up to what Reverend Ray asked because you know we we live in a generation where people are so easily offended. It, and I find out that the sinners, well, at least from where I stand, are less offended by by the truth of the description than the saints of God. So it, that has been my experience. So I'm, I'm asking you if you feel that in our bid sometimes to be so politically correct that we lose the essence of, you know, what is it that we should be communicating to, to people? Uh, let, me, let me answer the question by asking a question. Um, you speak of the word lazy, but the word that came before lazy was wicked. And I think wicked is actually worse than lazy. And let me ask you the question, would, you, would, would God call his people wicked? And there's a famous scripture that we normally quote, if my people who are called by my name turn from their wicked ways. We, are, we have wicked ways. We are wicked. That is worse than lazy. So, so, so I hear what you're saying, brother, but I'm saying at the same time, I'm, I'm going to, it's not a matter of trying to be politically correct. It's a point of delivering the word of God. The, the same word that made effect in the day that Jesus lived. It's the same world in which we live. And, and, and what I've found, and this is from experience my brother, my, my brother. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not just sharing scriptures with you. I'm sharing from experience with you. I'm sharing from experience. When somebody comes to me and wants to be baptized in Jesus' name, I do an investigation and, and, and share with the individual the gospel and help that person to see themselves as somebody who is in need of salvation. And that means 
I've got that person need to see themselves as a sinner, see themselves as condemned on their way to hell. And sometimes the, 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 the deeds that they're involved in is considered to be wicked. And I've got to show them that from the scriptures for them to come to a place of conviction. Because guess what? We have baptized many a person who have never been repented and all know them don't get the Holy Ghost. And for you to receive the Holy Ghost, you must repent. And you cannot repent unless you're convicted. And it's the law of God, Psalm 19, that tells us that convicts the soul, it converts the soul. There's a conviction that is needed from the word of God. So through the word and the spirit being communicated, it brings the conviction. And so, again, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of politically correct, but I find effectiveness when I use the straight scriptures. I'm not opposed to the straightforwardness in us, sir. I, I'm just saying that this is the generation that we seem to live in where persons are so thin-skinned that the right. people of God, I'm not even saying the sinners, the people of God seem to be more offended by the truth than the sinners themselves. Okay, okay. Yes, we have, we have seen that before. Yeah, that is correct. Um, that's correct, my brother. Um, we have, we have, we, that is true. We've seen where persons are afraid to share with persons and tell them the plain truth for what it is. Feeling that I don't want to offend because if I offend, I might scare this person away. Um, but the truth is far from that. Um, it is true that when we actually deliver the mind of God and the word of God, it will bring transformation in the life. So, yes, I agree with you, my brother. Us as believers, oftentimes, and it could very well be... Um, I believe we have good intentions as to why we, we're trying to do, to communicate the message in such a way that it is received without being offensive. I think we have good intentions in doing so. But we have got to get to a place of, of examining the lives of these men of God who won hundreds of thousands of people, 3,000 souls in one day on the first day. And next day, 5,000 souls and transformed Asia in less than 20 years. And many of us are living in spaces for, for, for more than 20 years, and we have not yet transformed that space. And we, we have seen through the lives of the apostles how bold. So, so us as believers, my brother, which is what I, I hear you saying, us as believers need to now embrace this demonstration through the apostles and go forth in the power. And, and not be afraid to say the truth of God's word. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, my brother. Thank you, um, Minister James. Uh, Pastor uh, McLaughlin, Judith McLaughlin has a question. You can go ahead, Pastor Judith. Go ahead, Sister Judith. No, it was a mistake, sir. I'm sorry. It was a mistake. Okay. Problem. Um, there's a there's a question that I, that has been posed to me in the chat. Um, it says, please explain the parallel of not saved by works versus being a slothful servant. Now, let me see if I get this. All right. So number one, not saved by works, meaning that there's nothing we could have done to earn our salvation. God Almighty, through Jesus Christ, has done that for us. And it's for us to now accept this grace that he has given unto us. So we're not saved by words. Okay, all right. I think I got your question now. So, we're, so Ephesians chapter 2. Um, let me read it for you. So we're not saved by words, but we are saved to work. Is the, is the answer to the question. So Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, verse 8. For by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by work, but we are saved to work. And that's the parallel between that and being lazy. So we're saved to get the job done. We're saved to go and work. But the works that we do, in other words, it's, it's an expression of our gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. Surely Jesus does this song, and I use this to explain that, that, that this parallel that my brother, that I'm not sure if the brother is, but this person is asking. 
she sing the song for nine months. I carried the little boy right his bill for spreading my bed and mowing the, the lawn. And she went up the yard and he gave her a bill. And she said to him, for the nine months I carried you, rolling inside of me, no charge. And when she finished lay out to him, he, he, he said, paid in full. The point is, if he appreciated what his mother went through to bring him here, in, in, in raking the yard, in washing the dishes, in spreading the bed, he'd want to do that, not to earn favor, but to say, thank you, mommy for all you have done. And that's what I'm saying. So when we go and reach the soul, we're saying, God, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for healing my body. I'm showing my gratitude by expressing the work. And that's the answer to that question. Um, the person submitted the same. All right. So another point that is made in the chat, and I agree with the point. I believe there are different ways to convey the same message to different people that would affect change. I agree with you, completely agree. So we're not going to do it with, with everybody. We meet the person. I, I'm involved in, 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 in um, personal evangelism, home Bible study. So these are one and one. So as you talk to persons and you share with individuals, you're going to talk to them in that, in that, in that, in, 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 in that manner so you can actually be received. But it doesn't negate you from speaking the truth. One thing that I use predominantly in Bible study session is the word of God. So like this text that I just read, I would ask the person to read it. And when they've read it, I would ask them if the Bible is saying that they're wicked. And they are confessing and saying yes. And while they're confessing, they came under conviction and start to cry in their rooms. I'm telling you from experience. I asked them to read the text and they confess that I am wicked. I am a lost sinner and I need Jesus. So, so the method that I use personally is ask people to read the Bible. And then I, well, as they read, I ask them the question based on what they just read. And they say, are you saying that I am not saved? I said, read the text again, my sister. And she read it again. I said, what did the text say? And she said, you are saying I'm not? I said, did I say anything? And she has to come to the place of confessing. And I've seen many a person gotten saved like that. So thank you for that um, point, my sister. Yes, I agree with you. Amen. Pastor, the, the second question is going, oh, sorry, not the second, but the other question is going to be based on point number two, um, obeying God's word. Uh, you stated that Abraham, as long as he um, had his family with him, uh, that he was being disobedient. Oftentimes we are told or encourage that God has saved us to save the family or amen. He doesn't just call an individual, he calls the family. Could we get some clarification on that as it pertains to family and how do we navigate our um those terrains? All right. Thank you very much, brother. brother, brother. So um certainly once we have become saved, we have the responsibility to reach out to those who are among us. And, and we have seen the example of Peter going for Andrew. Um, I was Andrew, Andrew, I think, going after Peter afterwards. He was reached before. And so they're targeting their own loved ones, their own family members, first and foremost. We see that taking place in scriptures. Because when you get saved, you're going back home to your own family. So it is expected that we are going to, to definitely reach our family. Um, and, and that's a very powerful point you're making because many times we take our families for granted. They're living with us. We see them there and we don't fast for them. We don't pray earnestly and go into sackcloth and ashes and, and really get down and cry unto God on their behalf, travailing to give birth. Um, we oftentimes, many of us will do it for others, but not for our family members. But it is expected that we do so for our own family members, first and foremost, I believe. And so, by all means, um, the text, the text with, with Abraham, as you know, I know you're not, you're not, even though you may mention it, you're not using it in the context, because that was an instruction that came directly from the Lord for him to leave the family, right? But um, once you get saved, we need to reach everybody, including our family. Right. Thank you for clearing that up. It, it, it was also to the point of um, delayed obedience is still um, disobedience. So I wanted you to um, 
open it up a, li a little more um, for our partial obedience, rather, is still disobedience, um, as it were the case of Abraham trying to help his family. Um, all right, uh, if there are any other questions, again, feel free to raise your hands. Um, or, you know, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, we see uh, uh, our assistant bishop uh, in the person of uh, Pastor Philip Daly online. We greet you, sir. Amen. God bless you. Welcome. Uh, we also um, see... Um, uh, Pastor Agent Reed um, in our midst as well. God bless you, sir. Welcome. Go ahead, Pastor. All right. I, there's another, there's another, some persons are sending, sending the questions um, directly, so let me respond. So, um, Amen. Somebody is sharing Thank that much, asking for suggestion as to how to be a good witness when you have different um, cultural well, groups to reach and to share the gospel with. Right. Uh, is somebody talking? Uh, I'm not the sure. Pastor Daly is trying to speak, but his, his mic is extremely low. So mm -hmm. he sounds like he's about two miles away from the phone. Or the instrument. Yes, Pastor Dale, if, if you could just adjust your speaker and then come back in, that'd be fine. Uh, go ahead, Pastor Willis. All right. So, um, somebody asked us for strategies that could be used um, in reaching a community that is um, of another ethnicity. Um, so, let me give you an an uh, an example. Um. I, I've trained persons here in Jamaica home Bible study, and one of that one of those persons went to the United States as a student, enrolled in the university, and when they got to the university, they started to do home Bible study on campus, just connecting with the students, their own students in their class, start sharing the word, and then afterwards they set up they set up a home Bible study ministry on campus, and it moved from setting up our own website on campus to the point of having open air service on campus. I got videos of white people being water baptized, um, being baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. What happened? She took the Bible study training that she got, sat down in person, shared the word of God, and they received the word of God, and they got saved. Had sessions, trained them with the same training that she got, to do the same thing that she did and the campus, we had a number of students and then she partnered with others. Right now, last time I spoke with her, she started another ministry on another campus. So she has finished school, but there are two campuses on two university campuses that now has home Bible study ministry taking place and people of different ethnicity is actually being saved through a method called home Bible study. Now, let me make a, a very powerful a very important point. While the method works and is good, we're not short on methods. Most times I find us short on hearts. Because when we have a heart, the method will come. Once I have a burden for the souls, I know a lady, she owns a restaurant, and what she does, every customer that comes in there, she takes their name, she takes their number, serves their meals, and between Friday and Saturday, she called all of them, invite them to church. Not all come, but some come. And when some come, they actually, got, they actually get saved. What about that? Holy Holy Ghost. That's her method. My, my concern is not so much the method. Method can always, um, you can, the, the method can vary. But once you have the heart for the soul, God will inspire the method. All right? The home Bible study is one of the proven methods for sure. That has worked. And if you have a heart for it, it will work and we'll see the results. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, that, that. There's another one. Um, all right, very good question. Um, the example that I raised by Brother Reed is asking, and then I explain, and then 
they receive the instructions to go. Should this be the strategy we use to initiate the evangelism move, or should we have targets and seek how seek God how to pursue? Um, all of the above. <laughs> and that means we need to live the devotional life and God will speak to us in reaching others. And we also need to go because the instruction is for us to go and to reach the Lord. So as we go and we share, there are other opportunities. So there are different ways God will use us to reach souls. And we just need to go um, respond by going, number one, because the command is already given. And we can also go and seek the Lord and say, Lord, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the Lord will speak to us. So all of those methods are proven and scriptural, and anyone will do. For, for sure, as a body of believers, we have a responsibility to go. And individually, we must go. In our workplaces, we're, we're, we're in our workplaces and they're unsafe there. It is my responsibility as a co-worker to reach my brothers and sisters. They're there. It's a captive audience. They're my friends. I, I've done that at the office. I, I read, when I was in Bible school, learned a lesson now, Psalm 126, 5 and 6, that if we go there in precious seed, we shall doubtless come rejoice in bringing in the sheep. And I looked around my office and I learned that principle for the first time. And I said, Lord, who can I try out this thing on? And I was trying out the word of God. And I Selected one young lady. She didn't know I was praying for her. I decided to talk to God. I wanted to change my strategy. Instead of talking to the persons about God, I wanted to talk to God about the person. And I went into fasting. I went into prayer. I sought the Lord. The young lady had nothing to do with Pentecostals. She don't like us. She don't like our standards. And I watched that young lady leave from where she was. Invited me. The Pentecostal Tabernacle Wildman Street for her baptism. I watch her go down in that pool. And two weeks after, God fill her with the power of the Holy Ghost. That's another method. Just going before the Lord, selecting somebody. I was, I was trying to the scripture. Lord, you say if I sow in tears, I shall reap in joy. Let me find out if the Bible is true. And so I sowed in tears and I reap in joy. So all those methods are proven, are scriptural, and should be employed. Amen. Um, Pastor, in following up with the question that was asked concerning Saul and Ananias, um, I so in going right, and and this this is this is um kind of stretching um the point here, but I have I have encountered where individuals that um, is not necessarily from our denominations or organizations have also called upon us um, to come and share the word. Uh, how do we um, navigate that? Because um, I remember uh, just um, sharing a, a testimony. I remember someone that is from an apostolic organization saying that they don't mix and mingle. And um, it, with that approach, they were actually saying that in the, anyone outside of their fellowship in terms of ministerial fellowship, they don't cross path with. So you could even be apostolic and, and they it's just going to be a no. So how do we na navigate that as teachers, as preachers, um, where that is concerned? All right, very good question. Um, I work with the UCAM Ministries on the UTEC campus in particular. I work with a number of other campuses, Michael and the university. But I'm predominantly based at the UTEC where I teach Bible studies to the UCAM group. Um, in teaching there, the ICF group also comes to join the UCAN to the point where the ICF group has invited me on more than one occasion to speak to them because they have come and sat down in our Bible study, heard the word, because I go, I go straight word. I use straight word like I used in this platform a while ago. And people are drawn to the power of God's word because what, what people want today more than ever is the word of God because it has the capacity and the ability to transform lives. And so I went to, I went to a meeting where I see a call on campus, over 600 students, and they asked me to speak to the students. What do I do? I preach the raw word of God. I'm going to walk the scriptures, walk the scriptures, walk the scriptures. And when I say walk the scriptures, 
I am walking the scripture verse by verse, and I'm sharing the verse as it unfolds, and people are receiving the word. Through those ministries, we have, we have, we have, we have, through the ministry, through the Yukon ministries, we have won some of the souls. We didn't win everybody, but we win some of the, some of the persons. Next week, Friday, a, a, not a, a non-apostolic church completely. Um, I think there are, there, there are either Baptists or Methodists. From, my co from one of my coworkers, because at my workplace, I do the Easter cantata for them. They ask me to do Easter cantata. They ask me to do Christmas cantata. And I've done it a number of years. Now they want me to come to their church. Guess what? Next week, Friday, I'll be at their church doing their Easter reflection. And I'm going straight word. And so you can't go wrong when you go the word. You're going to have to just deal with it. The anointing on your life makes the difference in the communication of that. And how that is delivered. But guess what? It was, she has heard the message so many times that she has convicted her own church to invite me to come there, a non-Pentecostal church, to come. And, and, and um, not, only, not only a church, there are a number of institutions, uh, municipal council, municipal parish councils, um, several institutions that want to have their devotion done. And persons are familiar with me. And they call me in. And I go in, straight word. And out of those sessions, I've heard persons say, oh, which church do you go to? I, I, I like how you deliver the word. I want to come to your church. And it happens. It happens, brothers and sisters. It happens. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, those pointers, because... Uh, I, too, um, being a part of UCAM, for those of you that don't know what the acronym uh, speaks to, is the University College and Apostolic. Did I say it right? Ministries, yes, sir. Ministries, amen. And um, when I was attending Edna Mandy School of the Visual and Performing Arts, I was a part of the group. And, and what I found that is we were given a platform to minister to people at the university level that had nothing to do with ap apostolic or pentecostal the, the apostolic or pentecostal experience um but because we were given the opportunity to share uh, many uh, believed in the rastafarianism uh, concept and in those environments we were given the opportunity to share and we, to this day, they're still apostolic. I, I can remember the souls that received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, but that was at the college level. When I, when I, when I then started uh, becoming more involved at the, the church level, um, I realized that they, it can, we can easily run into some red tapes. And uh, for individuals, especially those that have been kind of exposed to a different uh, modular concept as you come or stuff, or stuff like that, um, we are seen as the rebellious type. Um, in, in, um, we're seen as being rebellious at times when it comes on to going. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you kind of shared that. Uh, <laughs> Removing the rebellious type, though, or, or stuff like that, what are some practical ways in following up with this question that if, we, if we're if we in an, an experience like that, if, 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 if it's not a person like you that's a lead pastor, um, maybe they're just a, a brother or a minister in the assembly, sister, how can they navigate... Um, when the Lord has spoken to them, laid on their heart to do something, or an invitation has been given, how should they navigate these um, things, especially with their pastor? All right, number one, if any member of for, well, you ask it, I, I want to think that um, the pastor for this group certainly has outlined that. So if you're asking me from my personal perspective, then I'm going to say that um, any member of any assembly that's invited to go anywhere, I believe that that person should consult with their pastor first to find out whether or not they should permit, be permitted to go. 
And whatever the pastor tells you, you work with what your pastor tells you. That's my belief, right? Your pastor is the one who is there as your spiritual head and covering, and you submit any invitation. You don't, I don't encourage anybody to take it up on their own, to go out on their own. Even when you have a birthing of a, of a, of a ministry or, or a passion to do something, carry to your pastor. That's how Home Bible Study started for me personally. Um, I went to my pastor with it. I shared it with him, and he said, go right ahead. I went ahead. I did it, and I saw results, and I brought that results and showed him of persons being saved. And he said, well, you need to launch it into a ministry. I said, all right, no problem, sir. And we launched it into a ministry, and it grew from strength to strength. And more than one church now has the ministry. So consult with your pastor. Get the blessing and the leading of your pastor, and the Lord will lead and guide accordingly. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Are there any other questions at this time um, or comments? Uh, feel free. While they're, coming, while they're coming in, Brother Matthew, let me make another point. Um, through the Home Bible Study Ministry in particular, this is one of the areas that I have worked in um, for quite a while and still do work in. Throughout COVID, I did Home Bible Study even online. In Malaysia, people coming under the anointing of the Holy Ghost online doing a Home Bible Study session. We are, there's no bounds. We have in, we have gated communities, and guess what? There are no barriers to home Bible study because these persons are inviting you to come to their home. So where I can't have a, a a street meeting because in a gated community there are certain rules and regulations. Guess what? There are members in that community who invite us to come into their homes, sit down with them, and do a Bible study. And guess what? When their lives are impacted, they tell the neighbor about it, and you get an, an opportunity to infiltrate that community without any barriers. Um, and so this is one of the avenues that I've found, I've found to be really, really, really powerful and impacting and life transforming. Because you end up forming a partnership, a relationship with these persons. You're going to somebody's home six to eight weeks, one, one day a week, for about 45 minutes, one hour, sharing with the word of God to the point where they start to now trust you and they start to ask and to open up to you. And not only do you give them the word, sometimes they buy a bag of groceries because sometimes the person might have some need and you supply the natural need and you supply the spiritual need and they come and get saved. I met persons of other faith like that in their homes, gone to um, Universal Church, for example, and they do all kind of symbolism and water splashing and all those things. And alone. All I've done, gone into the homes, share the word of God, and after sharing the word of God, I remember this lady, after the fourth, after the fourth um, study, she never went back to the universal church. She came to she came to Bethel, and she has been she has been there since. So for my soul. All right. Any Amen. other questions before we go? Yes. Um, sir, as you're talking about the own Bible study, are there any books or materials that you specifically used or do you how do you navigate your teaching um materials all right so over the years after doing it we developed manuals so just by going out we started by going out first uh well let's say we started by by looking at new testament salvation how persons are to be saved and then out of that we start to develop manuals so we have three manuals right now, a manual on the Sabbath, a manual on the, one, a manual on the oneness of God, and a manual on New Testament salvation. So we use those manuals now to train persons, to equip them to go into the field and to do the home Bible study. And, and are those uh, manuals available to individuals if they wanted to purchase them? And how can they go about Getting those. Um, I've never, thought, I've never thought of selling them before. Um, normally, persons have shown interest and have just actually given them the manual, and they have gone ahead and um, started the ministry. Um, so it's something I could share with you. All right, thank you. So, um, so for anyone that is is interested, um, you can just reach out to me, um, if you're interested in in getting these materials. And we will try and coordinate to get them to you. Um, if, if, for example, you're feeling 
the drive, which everyone really should be feeling the drive to win souls. Amen. As we have learned tonight, it has to do with our passion. Amen. And our desire. And so if we love the Lord, soul winning should be easy. I, I, I want to acknowledge a very good friend of mine that is on. Um, I think it is him, uh, Pastor Anthony Brown, um, from the House of Prayer in uh, I think Brooklyn, New York. Bless you, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. Pleasure to be on. Amen. Incognito. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. Any questions, Pastor Brown, or comments? No, highly informative. I'm uh, just in highly interested in the manuals. So I was planning to contact you about those manuals. God bless you, Pastor. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Yes, sir. Amen. And and uh, we're, we're getting some messages as well concerning. So I, I will definitely um, be in, um, I will coordinate with Pastor Willis um, so that we can get these manuals out um, to the saints. Amen. Thank you again, sir. Amen. For coming and for sharing. Uh, did not our heart burn within us when we heard the word of God um, go forth? Uh, Pastor, just before you go, um, I know you have some information that will be profitable, especially to some of our pastors serving in Jamaica. And that is... Um, uh or let me let me just confirm too. Are there any other questions before I go on? Yeah, there are there are a couple of questions. Some persons have submitted to me directly. Okay, go so ahead. To... Yes, sir. You can go ahead and uh, before I move on. All right, no problem. So another question that's in the chat. Uh, how can we impact our fellow brethren? No. How should we progress in this area? Should we start light, then go heavy, or just hit tax to at the initial stage? Also, any other tips to start a home Bible study? All right, very good question. Um, um, you want you want me to explain that, but I'm not sure you want to set up another session to do the to do the home Bible study session itself. Oh you yeah, well, that? no, you can go ahead because this is why we're here. We've come to learn tonight. No problem. All right, so um, let me answer a question in terms of she say go heavy or just hit up two thirty. So when you go to somebody's home, it's very very. By the way, we, all the persons in this group are Christians, right, Brother Matthew? Okay, all right. Yes. But if yes. you had a visit that was not if you had a visitor that was not saved, I contact a live home Bible study with you with that person right now in the face of you all. Okay. But um if you go to, number one, how do we get to somebody's home? Sometimes they come to our church, we have visitors card, and on the visitors card we ask whether or not they like home Bible study and they they, they check the box. I said, home Bible study. So they already asking me to come to their home to do home Bible study. We send two persons. No one person go to any home. Two or three persons go to a home, sit down with that individual. Good evening. How are you today? I see you have expressed interest in having home Bible study. Is there a particular area of study that you'd like to do? You're talking to the individual. Um, no, anything. Is, I'm fine with anything. All right, let's start with salvation. How about that? Are you saved? And she might say, yes, I am saved. It's all right. Wonderful. Let's go to the Word of God. And you go to the Word of God and you let her read. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And you ask the person, did it say cannot enter? And then you ask the person, can you enter? And they have to answer the question. You're asking questions. Asking questions is what you use to win souls. Not, not argument, not pushing your thing. Asking questions based on the Scripture. Let, let the Scripture do the work. Let the Scripture do the work. And whenever a question is asked, you use the scripture to answer the question. And so we give them the scriptures and the scripture. And that's why we have seen persons in their home, broken, weeping, confessing. And guess what? The gifts of the spirit start to operate. You talk about, we come to church and we're looking long into the gifts of the spirit. And it's not happening. I walk into somebody's home and the Lord says, this young lady has been sitting here the whole day contemplating suicide. Because she's, her life, she feels like her life has crashed and it don't make any sense. And instead of going with the script that I went, the Lord says, talk to her from Jeremiah. And I said, I said to her, um, you know, there are persons in this world who think that life don't make any sense anymore. 
and they feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. So I'm drawing her, I'm drawing her attention to the story of her own life. And then while I'm sharing that story, the conviction hit her, she's crying. And she begins to confess. And I said, the thought that the Lord thinks towards you are not evil, but of good. And she starts to bawl even more. Because the Lord is now dealing with her and speaking to her. So how do you approach it? Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And, and what you call a um, deductive analysis. So you're, you're talking, having the conversation, and you're feeling where the person is at. And based on where they're at, you draw the word, you draw the sword, you draw the scriptures that is relating to what the person is saying and allow the Lord to lead you in the session. All right, so before you get to that, se that segment where you can operate like that, because I didn't start like that. <laughs> I started out with my script in my hand and I worked the script. But over time, God gave you the script. When you walk in the room, God gives you the script. Because he'll tell you what's happening in people's lives. Later say, you know, I'm not doing anything. I just listen to little one man may have on the side, you know. And God not, God not punish me if I have little one man on the side. I never ask her about any man. She is telling me because she's under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying, I'm saying the gift of the Spirit is going to help us to win the souls. We cannot win the souls by ourselves. I said it early in the presentation. And so I hear the questions come in and we seem to be afraid to say some things. Don't worry. Don't worry. The Lord will put the words in your mouth. Be willing to say it. And allow God to work it and bring salvation to the soul. All right, so that is that question. How can we impact our fellow brethren who have gotten distracted on their journey and losing hope and faith in their God? I see where there was a lot of talk about impacting the unsaved. All right, very good. So this person is looking at how do we impact our own selves? How do we impact our own selves? And that's where the word again comes into play. The seven churches in Asia, I'm using these as examples because I like to use word, word pictures for you to see what I'm saying. And I, I have a limited amount of time, so I'm trying to cram it as fast as I can. But while the church had backslidden and lost its first love, it had no idea. While the church had Jezebel teaching people to fornicate, it had no idea. While the church of Thyatira was married to the world, it had no idea. John was in prayer, got the revelation, and showed the church its own condition. So how do we do it? We get before the Lord like John, and we ask the Lord, and we talk to the Lord. This is where our pastors, this is where our teachers, this is where our ministers get into place now. Because we are called to perfect the saints, to edify them, and for the work of the ministry. And so what we do, we go before the Lord, and we receive divine intelligence from heaven, and we impact the congregation, because we must get them motivated to the point of carrying the good news of salvation. All right? So the Lord will reveal to us, Notice he did it for each of the individual churches because each church has their own different situation. But the Lord gave John each church their condition and told them what they need to do to have the problem resolved. And in like manner, it is us looking in the mirror of God's word that causes us to see ourselves and like Isaiah in ministry, reach a point where he says, woe is me, I am undone. And when the Lord says, who will go? He says, here am I, send me. He got a glimpse of himself through the mirror of God's word. Well, through a vision, but for us, through the mirror of God's word, shows us ourselves, shows our condition, and when we see ourselves, we will repent, we will respond, and get back on track. So that's the answer to that question. For those of us who have been distracted, um, all right, I think that's it that I'm seeing so far. Is there any other? Right, those are the questions that I saw in the chat and, and responded to. Over to you, Brother Matthew. Amen. I, I like that last last example as it pertains to the uh, the churches in Asia Minor. Um, oftentimes, it is challenging, however, um, with the concept of the minister, the pastor praying, and um, coming to deal specifically with what is in the church. Um, I've, I've heard this concept before, and I don't know if I subscribe to it, and I'd like to show it out there um, for you to um, share some light on it. Uh, there are some individuals that are of the mindset that it is better if an outside preacher, prophet, minister comes and deal with what is going on in the church, um, 
you know uh you know you know how how we how we get sometime somebody comes from outside preach what is going on in the church and people say that is of god um but when pastor minister or brother sister preaches it at church um they're of the opinion that it is um hearsay uh you know why you go up to preach it how do we navigate um those uh, situations and is 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 All it right. a good or bad for you know outside to come or inside to preach and so that outside doesn't have to deal with it how do we deal with that a right, very good question and again from the scriptures unto the angel of the house unto the angel of the church of ephesus john is writing to the pastor of the church of ephesus he tells him what is in the church and he expects of him to address the issue unto the angel of the church of smyrna each of them are addressed to the pastors of the church all right so that's number one so it is expected that the pastor will take from the holy spirit the issue remember it's a principle that god operates by it. number one when god is talking to you he speaks to you first when he can't get to you then he go outside of you he's talking to israel and when he can't get to israel he go outside of israel to talk to israel inside it has always been the principle. He talks to you first. You have the Holy Ghost inside of you. And after talking to you and you're not responding, he goes outside of you to get your attention. So if I don't take heed, so he's talking to me, unto the angel of the house of this church. My responsibility as the leader is to deal with the matter the Lord has revealed unto me. I know, I know what you're saying in terms of other persons come in and will say, well, the word has been confirmed. And, 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 and fine, if persons feel comfortable doing so and the lord can operate like that i see that as us not accepting and pastors might see it as having no honor in their own country but guess what let it never be said that we have not done what the lord has indicated for us to do and then if, if we if we refuse the man of god inside like we refuse the holy ghost talking to us inside then god might have to go outside and talk to us but we have a responsibility respond and we have responsibility as leaders to communicate and to deal with whatever issues i think of the church as a family mommy and daddy and children and if there's a problem in my house it is my responsibility to deal with it amen um let the record show that i i agree with that point too I, I I definitely don't have a problem with um you know a prophet pastor uh, sister uh, brother coming from without and confirming what has been shared in the church, but I I just I think that if someone has to come from outside and it's the first time the church is going to be hearing it, then I think that we have failed as ministers as pastors. Um, you know, it's almost like it's almost as if we would need to go back to God and, and say, Lord, you promised us that you would give us pastors after your own heart. Uh, why why is it that another nation has to come and chastise us, someone else, and we had pastors that are supposed to be, um, you know, with your heart caring for us? And so I, I thank you for... um bringing that up. Uh, Minister Palmer said that you think that it might be a trust issue. Um, uh, I'm guessing on the part of the saint um, not receiving. Uh, but but I, I want to say that I don't think it I, at this point, I don't think it has anything to do with trust because Paul writing to Timothy, he, he shared what the word is for. It's for reproof, rebuke, correction. And so if 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 that is not coming, I mean, wh whether we're best friend or not, if if the word of God is going to be questioned, then you know, there that's there that's great concern. So I I thank you for for pointing that out, preacher. And honestly, that point you just made, brother Matthew, um, it's going to be it it. Pastors might have that experience where there are struggles within their own congregation. But one thing is for sure, 
any, any congregation at all, whether they want to struggle with the past uh, um, or not, should not, I don't think once you're anointed that that can be, that can be denied because you, you will have persons who don't like you. That is a given that comes with the turf and the territory. But even to those who hate you will have to acknowledge that the anointing of God is on your life. And, and, and it's obvious. And, and I've known of persons in, in different churches who don't like the past. I've had to counsel persons like those. And, and, um, but they can't deny it that God has called this man or called this woman and this person is a set man or a set woman for the hour, for this local assembly. And so with that mindset, and I, 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 I know that pastors go through various different shows, but we know as pastors um, what comes with the territory and are persuaded in our own hearts. I like, guess what? Even with that is so, we operate within the calling, within the anointing that God has given to us, and we still get the job done. In season, out of season, we are we are, we are stewards and we are we are tasked with responsibility of feeding the flock of God and God always encourage our hearts because they're there. while there, the sites are there the persons are saying pastor so, 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 so this, this is what happens one person say why would a pastor get a message I, I, I must be my true word but enough out of order rude and another person said my God pastor that word you gave today, that word saved my soul. My most part of the said that. And they have heard it on both sides. And so we know, because God has to send a word to encourage our hearts at times. All right? So it comes to the territory, and we are encouraged to do God's word, even in the midst of persecution and opposition. Back to you, my brother. Bless you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. So true. Uh, so true. I, I myself have experienced both sides of the spectrum where that is concerned. Amen. Um, so, Pastor, just before you go, um, I remember in a discussion that we had, uh, you spoke about some things, and this is uh, especially for those that's living in Jamaica. For those of us here we can uh, in the U.S., we can utilize the principle um, as well. But we... It, as it pertains to mission, one way of helping the mission or the gospel to remain um, consistent in, in, a, in a world that is consistently trying to stifle the gospel is by using, uh, it's by our money. I, I don't know anywhere else to say, how else to say it, uh, but we power the ministry by our money. Um, and guess what? You can power the ministry by your money, even in debt. And so I'd love for pastor to give us the principle of how we can be effective, even in debt, and with helping our local churches. All right. Um, so using what you have. That's where you have to really start. You have to use, you have to start with what you have first and foremost. Little is much when God is in it. All right? And in obedience to the Lord and doing what the Lord says, the Lord begins to bless out of what you start giving. Um, I really, it, it, it so uh, again, if I use home Bible study as a method, um, if I personally want to do Bible study and I'm not, I'm not able to fund it, what I used to do sometimes, and if, I, if, if it is that I'm not able to, most times I was able to. But if at all something comes up, I'll probably ask the pastor to assist. I'm going out on this, on this mission field, this activity, this home Bible study, and we found a couple um, brethren who are in great need and like to help them with that need. And the pastor normally helps and assists that way. But start with what you have. Each individual can start with what they have. We can take the little and also pull it together, and out of it, we can start to fund other projects um, that can be that are geared towards soul winning. It could be a, an open air meeting, it could be a home Bible study, it could be a, a street walk. All right, and um, just just I shared with Brother Matthew that just Saturday through the Bible school, um, we did a open air meeting in Port Royal. So we went through as part of the curriculum of the students is to do an evangelism exercise 
one or two, well, two or three, two or three um, different evangelistic thrusts throughout this semester. So we went to Port Royal on Saturday and we went, take all the students and we went throughout the community. That will only cost us the money to drive to go there. And so we would enter the community, speak with the people, we connect to a church, a local church within that community and partner with them. And we go through the community, we talk, we, we share with people, we witness to people, we pray with people, we, we just work with the people. And at the end of the day, I started like, like 10, 11, 12 o'clock in the morning, um, after that, 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at noon. Um, and then uh, we get back to the church. The church puts a little meal together. And then in the night, we have an open air meeting. We have invited the community to an open air meeting in a central location that the community normally is at. So it's not at, the, not at the physical assembly, but at an open space where a lot of people normally gather on a Saturday night. And we get that area to use, and we have a street meeting. And it's events like these. So, so, so these, these are other avenues where people pool together their resources, spend the money for transportation. The church that they go to and partner with takes on their full responsibility, and we just share the gospel and communicate with love. Um, so, so individually, what we have, as small as it is, use it, and God will turn it around and bless it and multiply it. Um, and when we start doing that, other persons hear and see the result and start to invest in the ministry. That's another avenue that I've seen, and it has been, um, let me tell you, that has been amazing. People want to see good grounds that are in operation, and they put their money there. Because guess what? The, the evidence is there that people are getting saved, and people are being delivered and set free. Again, when, when somebody is delivered and set free, and you know the individual from your community, and people see it, people come to church to come find out what is going on, and they get saved as well. Uh, one lady we did a, I did a Bible study when I just started pastoring. Um, she owned her own business. And by the time I won her to the Lord, she brought, she was carrying 15 people in her car. Well, she made more than one church <laughs> to Bible study on a Tuesday night. And, and, and she, has, she has won several, several, um, a good portion of the congregation. Most of the persons in the congregation right now are won by home Bible study. Home Bible study they brought them. We went to their homes. They came to our church. We took their, they wrote their name in the one Bible study. Or you're at work and your friends say they want to buy your co-worker. Or you're on the bus traveling and you see somebody on the bus and you greet them and you say hi to them. And you start a conversation. Before you know it, you get their name number. You start a Bible study. Go to their home, sit down with them, they get saved. They have a death in a loved one. They have a death. You go there and you, 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 you grieve with them and you work with them. You win them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Could you share more about the debt and the insurance as well? All right. So the in Jamaica, we have an insurance company in particular um, that has started a new venture by offering churches uh, um, a policy, insurance policy at reduced rates. Because they know they're getting a group, they're getting a church filled with people. So what they have done is partner with the churches and offer this opportunity where you pay a minimum and you have different packages. Um, you have a package at two thousand something dollars, you have a package at five, six thousand, a package at eight thousand. So depending on what the congregation can manage, you select a package and that money is paid for the year and it covers you for one year. And it is renewed every year. Every year I have to pay that new money to, to provide coverage for and it covers death. Um, should somebody die in the in this in the in the church, um, then if they're on this insurance policy, they the money actually covers them um because they, they would have left that money now in the care of their beneficiary that has now the opportunity. Because we have, we found ourselves in a situation where persons were dying and they couldn't afford to bury their loved ones. And we as a church took up the responsibility to bury people dead. And you know, burying people dead is expensive. So we partner with the insurance company. And out of that, some persons have decided to, hey, put on the church as a beneficiary, you know, and we get a little something. Otherwise, we don't, we don't charge anybody. We just do it as a service to the, to the congregation. Some persons put on the church. We're not, we're not forcing anybody to. Some persons do, some persons don't. Some persons leave their loved one. But at the same time, what it does, it enables that loved one 
to be able to cover. And if there's an accident, so not only that, but if there's an accident that occurred where you need um, insurance to cover your bills, that comes on, as part and parcel of that policy, depending on which policy you have selected. And so as a local assembly, this is something that we have done and we have, we have gained, we have benefited from it um, immensely. And persons who have passed have experienced, sad to say, we just had a member who passed um, yesterday. And this person, has, um, from my recollection, is on the policy as well. So the family has not this strain upon them now to sign the resources to bear their loved ones. Because guess what? A policy that costs a minimum amount was able to cover them. Wow. Thank you so much um, for sharing that, Pastor Willis. And our condolences to the church there in yes. Pomer. Um, Thank you. I, I see where Minister Palmer said that the presentation was done at one of one of our um, branch churches in Ellerslie. Um, but I'm not sure if the policy has been enacted. And uh, we would love, amen, uh, for our churches. I am calling all our churches in Jamaica uh, to this. And, and, and for those of you that are, okay. All right, thank you for sharing that, Mr. Palmer. Um, I'm asking all our leaders, please, if a part of, Evangelism, um, as as we were told even tonight, is having compassion towards others. This is a way or means of showing that we have compassion towards others. Let us do something to protect our members, protect their families, um, so that they are not left out in the cold, and it does not burden the church. All right. It doesn't burden the church. Um, and the possibility is there to help the church, even in a time of loss, to continue fighting the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. So, amen. so thank you all again. Amen for coming. Pastor Willis, it is indeed our pleasure to have had you tonight. Thank you for taking the time to walk us through, amen, um, step by step, amen. And, and, and I'm going to ask our, amen, Secretary, Minister Mighty, to just come on and, and, and leave the vote of thanks in Jesus' name. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus, everybody. Pastor Willis, on behalf of Praise Sanctuary Ministries International Missions Department, I truly just want to say thank you for really ministering to us in the few minutes that you did, and then you followed through with the, the question and you answered. Truly, it has opened our eyes. It has brought us to another place for those who have had questions and wanted to be refreshed. We were re refreshed and we are empowered to go once more. And my prayer is that the Lord will continue to minister through you, that you will continue to impact the lives of those that are yet to be a part of the body of Christ. My desire is that you will not lose focus, that you will remain on track and you will allow, as you are allowing now, the spirit of the Lord to continue to use you. I just want to thank you. And I pray that you will continue to minister, not only just to the unsaved, but I also pray that the Lord will broaden your ministry to a place where you will allow yourself to minister to pastors, 
and to those that are called into ministry at a point as this, because I personally believe that the apostolic movement and the, the kingdom of God desire and need more persons that are, are rooted and grounded, solid, and are more kingdom-minded at a point as this. And so God bless you. Truly, I will take my own personal time to send a prayer for you and your family. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Sister Mighty. And the Great Sanctuary Ministry International, really appreciate it. I certainly crave your prayers. I really please keep myself and family in your prayers and our church in Jesus' name. God bless. Amen.